I am uh, thankful to be in front of you again. Uh, nice to see everyone's faces. Um, I'm going to continue in our study of the book of Acts. Let us turn to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 20 through 25. Acts 16, 20 through 25. And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, They cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Praise God. So this is a passage that is very familiar to us, and I've heard many messages about it. Um, And I myself referenced this the last time I spoke, and I said a couple of things from this passage last time. I wanted to focus on one thing that will be my topic today, which was at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So just a little bit of context. Um, What's happening there is Paul was in Philippi, and and it's a place in in Macedonia, and as they were in that place, when they were going from one place to another, there is a little girl who had an evil spirit, and people used to use that uh, evil spirit within that girl to get, uh, make money from fortune telling from other people, Okay. So when Paul was walking and Silas was walking by this place, uh, this girl would go after them and say, these are the servants of the Most High God, uh, listen to them, right? And they were, she was praising them. It happened a few times. Finally, Paul was just like w- uh, troubled by this and he rebuked this evil spirit out of this girl and she was completely healed. And when the people that used to use this little girl for uh, fortune-telling and, uh, you know, uh, sorcery saw that the reason for their, you know, making money, uh, money-making scheme was now uh, gone away, they caught Paul and Silas and brought them before the magistrates and accused them, saying that these people are coming into our land, these foreigners, and they're teaching customs and practices that are foreign to us, and... And so then there was a big uproar there, and the magistrates, uh, you know, like it even says that t- uh, tore his clothes, and, com- and com- they were so upset that, you know, these people, they looked at them as foreigners, and, um, and s- was so upset at them, and that he commanded to beat them, and, you know, punished and tortured them, and threw them into the prison. And so now Paul and Silas, if you think about it from their perspective, they're like, wow, I just did something good. And how could this be happening to me, right? I'm being tortured for something I thought I did good for somebody else. So anyway, so Paul and Silas were thrown not only in the prison, they were th- it says they were thrown in the innermost prison, okay? They were thrown in the inside, probably a dark, dark place. And also, not only that, they were feet, uh, feet were shackled, right? So... They were inside this little prison, and they were shackled so that they couldn't move. Okay, so now imagine that situation. And they were in this place, and in the middle of the night, at midnight it says, Paul and Silas were awake. They were not sitting, moping about their situation. They were not downcast about what had just happened to them. They were not upset at the injustice that just happened to them. But what did they rather do? They did not spend time complaining about 
all these things happening to them, but they prayed and sang praises to God. You all with me? So they sang praises to God in the midst of the most, uh, uh, probably in a while, uh, greatest injustice that had just happened to them. And there was nobody there to encourage them or support them but each other. They had each other's fellowship and with each other they sang praises to God. So now I, I was trying to understand what this means. Because when we say praise, we certain things conjure up in our mind. We have certain, you know, we think and imagine when we come together to church and we sing two songs of Malayalam, two songs of English, that we designate as praise and worship, right? But each of these things have meanings in the Bible. That there are diff- even the word praise uh, have two or three different words, Hebrew words that are used to uh, designate praise. And so, and sometimes we think that, you know, when we say good things about God, that's what praising God is. It's not like what this little girl was doing, right? What, this, what was this little girl doing there? She was flattering these two men, right? They're saying good things about them, but she didn't mean it. It did not come from her heart. But, but when, when the Bible talks about praise, it's something different. It's not just coming here and singing two songs uh, and just mechanically. So, so we'll come back to that. But first, there's a few things I looked into. There are a few, uh, the most uh, common place that you find the word praise in the English Bible is in the Psalms, right? Not surprisingly. So the two main word pra- places were words that I saw, the word praise had the root word, one was tehila, and the, the other one I saw was halal. Okay, Tehillah and Hallel. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will bless the Lord at all times and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So in that word praise is the word Tehillah. It actually talks about, it's very similar things, but there's little twists and nuances in the differences. So in this place, it's talking about um, celebrating and rejoicing and praising God. See, praising God is not just this mechanical, somehow an obligation to, uh, you know, uh, to just sing songs or... Because sometimes we imagine God as this big dictator sitting on the throne, right? Oh, here's this tyrant. We better praise him, otherwise something bad is going to happen to us, right? We also have this concept of... Uh, I would say karma in our minds, right, from our Hindu tradition. Sometimes we, we, we do things because if we don't do it, something bad's going to happen. Don't tell me you don't think that way. I know we all think that way, right? Sometimes we come to church, I, I can see how we're so reverential about the Holy Communion, but we're okay doing things, anything we want, before or after, right? So, but God doesn't operate this way. God doesn't, it's not like this tit, tit for tat with God. We're not praising God because he's some uh, dictator sitting on a throne, right? So anyway, so this word praise, the root word tahila means more celebratory. We're celebrating and rejoicing and praising him out of the depths of our heart because of who he is and what he did for us. You all with me? It is, comes from our inner being. And the other word that is commonly occurred uh, is the word halal. And this word means, I mean, there's very similar words, right? Praising, giving, uh, giving exaltation. Uh, praising somebody means talking great things about what they did or who they are. But another thing that struck me about that meaning was acting like a madman um, just because you couldn't contain your joy and you're just acting like a madman to praise somebody, right? So, you know, when we, when we are so enthralled about something in this world, right, we can't contain our, when we haven't seen our loved ones in a long time, we, we can't contain our joy when we finally see them, right? And when we 
we, nobody has to tell us to just, just be happy, right? It just comes from within. You all with me? So, so this is Halal, and, and the Israelites used to, uh, so it's specifically uh, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, 118 um, and then Psalm 136 were known as the Halal. It's Psalm 136 actually was known as uh, the great, or is known as the great Halal. So anyway, so they sing these songs primarily around the Passover and the different festivals when they celebrate. And, and they read these psalms and are singing them and remembering what God did for them. And so this, I believe this is what Paul and Silas was doing. They were singing these psalms and praises to God and did not, they did not get moved by what had just happened to them. It did not matter to them that they were in the prison. It did not matter to them that their feet were shackled. It did not matter that they were all alone, but they praised God out of the depths of their heart. And so much so, and it was so loud, and in the middle of the night, it says that all the prisoners heard them. You all with me? So this, so when I say, when I think about this, you know, sometimes we have this mind, you know, worship is we had to come here, clap our hands. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that yes, it says, yes, clap your hands and rejoice. But it's nothing in the Bible that says that's what praise is or that's what worship is. It doesn't say that, you know, we, I'm sorry, you might be mad at me, but worshiping is not clapping your hands. Okay? Actually, worship, and this is a whole different topic, so I'm not going to go into it. Uh, but worship is, uh, in the New Testament, is the word presnikios. And you'll see that throughout the New Testament, especially in the Revelation. And the word really just means to be prostrate before God and to bow down in reverence and obeisance, obeisance and to worship, to fall down. It says that the 24 elders fell down and worshiped, means they fell down before God. That is worship. So, but all of these things, there's a common thread. It says, I will bless the Lord. That's another word called Barak, which also means to kneel down before God. So all of these things come from within, come from inside of us. It is not the other way around. See, we can't force ourselves to praise God. Right? It just becomes like flattery. Right? But when we come, when we remember, when we remember who God is, when we remember what He's done for us and where He brought us out of the horrible pit and set our feet upon a rock and sent His own Son to die for us, when we remember that salvation experience, that the re great redemption that He did for us. We can't contain the praises that will come forth from our mouth. We should stop, break down these, you know, these rituals that we go through. These, these things that we've taught ourselves that, oh, if I just sing these songs, that means I have checked the box. If I clap my hands, I worship God. These are just, I mean, I'd rather you not clap your hands. Just sing from, from your heart. Sing together in fellowship. But the other thing we have to remember is that there's nothing in the Bible that says that the only time you praise is when you come together. Actually, it's quite opposite. Everything the psalm says, it's constant. It's continual. It says, I will praise the Lord. His praise will continually be in my mouth. His praise will continually be in my mouth. It says in Psalm 113, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun, I will praise Him. I will praise Him. It says when I am lying in my bed, I will sing, shout praises to Him with my mouth. See, this is because we don't live our regular lives this way, do we? We don't wake up and tell our children, I guess I should tell you I love you right now. I love you, my son. Or do you t speak to your wife this way? Do you speak to your husband this way? That, okay, it's 10 a.m. on Saturday. I guess I better tell you that I love you. 
We don't live our lives this way, do we? It comes from within. If not, they can tell that you're being fake. If people, regular human beings can say when we're being fake, how would the God of gods and King of kings sitting on the throne who sees our every thoughts and intentions not know when it's not from within? Psalm 22 says, so verse 3 says, He in, inhabits the praises of His people. So I wondered about what that means. See, it's not that God needs... It's not like somehow we're, we're not uh, on, like hamsters on a wheel trying to power you know, God's existence. Right? It's not like he's dependent, he's waiting for us to pray so he, can, he has fuel to survive for another day. It's not this way. He does not need us. He's self-sufficient. But when it says he inhabits the praises of his people, what it means is that when the people that are called by his name, when the people that he died for and redeemed, when the people that he loved from the foundation of the earth, when they sing out to him from the depths of their hearts and they cry out to him and sing, God, you are greatly to be praised. Your mercy endures forever. He comes down from his throne and inhabits our praises. His presence comes down and we commune with Him as a friend does with his friend. And we experience the presence of God through our praises. The other thing we have wrongly taught in, uh, in our churches uh, and our teachings today is, why don't you praise your way through something? Why don't you pray your way, worship your... See, the thing is that we don't praise or worship so we can get something in return. Paul and Silas was not singing praises so that they will be freed from the prison. They were praying and praising because that was their natural disposition. That's what they were doing. It was, they were saying, I, don't, I praise him when I'm free. Why not praise him when I'm in the prison? So we don't praise him because we want something. We praise him for who he is. You all with me? So the praise, that's why it says in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. All that is within me comes from the depth of our heart. Bless the Lord, O my soul. From within our hearts, we bless Him. So um, the reason sometimes we have to want, you know, sometimes this is difficult for us, is because our praises and our focus and our relationship with God is dictated by our feelings, right? So how we feel is how what we project, right, in our uh, communion with God. What, our, what we feel is what dictates how we sing or what we sing. But that is the opposite of what I've been saying here about praising. From the depths of your heart, when you pray, it is not dictated by how you feel. See, that's why it is such a wrong way to think about that what we, we our feelings, because we're so prone to, you know, being controlled by our feelings that we, you know, everything that sometimes when we feel, you know, hear a nice song or worship, we get so uh, taken up by it. So we, we, you know, we, you know, we sing praises and then it's just momentary and goes away, Right? But that's not, so again, fitting with what I've been saying, it's, this is more a continuous experience. Uh, as pastor I've been saying, well, who is a Christian? A Christian is one who continually praises God. See, the reason, the other reason, um, here I'll wrap up soon. The other reason that this is important is, see, uh, like I was saying, God is not this dictator sitting on a throne expecting our, you know, uh, our praises, right? But the reason is the only good, only good in this world is God. So when the goodness of God works out through us, we can't but praise Him. So we're praising for who He is, for His kindness and goodness. Anything that is good and glorious is defined by God. 
So we ourselves in a natural state are corrupt, right? We are, we are being corrupted by sin. But when the goodness of God, when the Spirit of God works through us, that those praises flow out because the goodness in us recognizes the only good God, only good being in this universe, and a praise is a natural reaction to that. Are you all following? So, so, so how, how could we, you know, how, what, what should we do about this, right? Um, before I go there, I, I was thinking of another exa- story that I read, um, re- like, why is this, you know, what effect does it have on yourself and on others, right? Here we can see the prisoners heard them. Uh, I remember a story uh, that I read a little while back. It's about... Um, uh, uh, in, in communist Russia, when at the time uh, when it was you know it was illegal to be a Christian, there was a pastor named uh, Dmitri. They used to have a house church, and as they were gathering together, they came and captured him, uh, Dmitri, and um, and they took him to prison and they sentenced him to 37 years in prison, just for having a meeting in in his house. 37 years in prison, and it's not. Um, it's not a pleasant place, I can tell you that. It was a tiny little place. So he said, it said you can take one step and reach your, the, the sink, one step to reach the toilet and the bed. So it's a tiny little place. And, and they were torturing him daily. Um, and so he was in prison for 37 years. And he had this one habit that he would do every morning and every evening because he didn't have a Bible or anything. But he would stand up in his prison and sing loudly. Uh, the uh, songs that God were giving him and having him write. Every morning and every evening, he was singing loudly from his heart, and the whole prison could sing, uh, to hear Dimitri singing through this, all year after year, day after day, month after month, year after year, Dimitri was singing the song of praise to God. He was not shaken by what punishment he had received. And, and the prisoners were making fun of him, and they were you know, they were actually, uh, you know, throwing feces at him. Like all kinds of horrible things, they made him uh, subjected to him. And, uh, and the prisoners were putting, uh, the prison guards were mixing his food with feces and bringing all these things and punishing him, trying to deter him from stop doing that. Because they didn't know where it's going to go. And, but that never stopped. Every single day, uh, he was doing that. And finally, one... Um, uh, towards the end of his prison term, one day he came out. Uh, they were, I think they were going to uh, execute him and, or at least pretend to execute him to see if that will deter him. And they brought him out. And all the other prisoners, 1,500 of them, were standing there. And they sang. And they were in one heart singing the song that Dimitri was singing all these years. So his perseverance made an impact on the lives of this 1,500 prisoners. And they changed their heart. He didn't have to say a single word of the gospel. But his life and his praise changed and melted their heart. And they started singing these praises when they brought Dimitri out after all these years. And, and the prison guards were shaken. They were like, who are you? I mean, what is going on? How could this happen? And he said, I have only one thing to say. I am Dimitri, the son of the most high living God. That's all he said. And then he was released a few years later. It's almost a similar experience. Is that he, it was not his circumstance the worship team can come forward. It's not his circumstance that dictated his praise. Our praise flows continually. His praise will ever be on my lips. Morning and evening, no matter what's happening, let our, his praises flow from our mouth. Let us bless the Lord at all times from the depths of our heart, from, from within us. And as the song, uh, as the song goes, why, you know, why, how can this happen, right? As the song goes, turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful faith and the things of the world shall go strangely dim. When we turn our eyes to Jesus, when we praise him and walk out this faith and look in his face, 
we don't have to do anything. All these things that we are worried about day in and day out, they'll just go dimmer and dimmer. And we, we can enjoy the continuous fellowship with our Master. May His name be glorified.